Okay, you can begin. All right. So I can talk a little bit already with the introduction. So it's my pleasure and honor to interview Christoph Parr here. Um, I know Christoph forever. No, that's not true. Um, I barely exist. 20 years, I guess, right? Some little more than 20 years. Thousand. Um, I barely existed as a cryptographer when I first met Christoph and Christoph was already a professor in, in Bochum and built up the whole institute there. So it's always been a privilege to know him. And well, now it's a privilege to interview him. So who needs to introduce Christoph? Well, I guess I should say a few words. Um, for those who've been attending chess since long, Long time you all know Christoph is one of the organizers, one of the starting organizers of chess. Um, but those who are new might not even understand that he is the person who gave us this nice event. He's the person who grew us from a small community into what we see now with hundreds of people online and also doing the live events. This is a community. Together with chatting, right? Yes, yes, yes. I should mention chatting. Um, and Christoph has been around in hardware security and software security for a long time. So I guess I've been talking for long enough um, that we can start. Do we have a quorum of people? Yeah, 90 people, that's pretty good. Um, so Christoph, um, you've been moving around a lot. I mean, as I mentioned, we started in Bochum, this institute, you've been to the United States before, you've been to the United States after, you're now moving within Bochum from Horst Goetz Institute to the MPI. So what's your feeling about US research, European research, or German research in particular? Well, I've been actually, I've been going back and forth. So as you know, for everybody in the room, I, I got my PhD in 94, I guess. And then I was quite lucky to get an um, assistant professorship at, in, in Massachusetts at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is a fairly small university with a strong focus on undergraduate education but they also have a good research program and um, so my and, and i spent there close to seven years so my first impression there was was really great from the us american american system because back then there was in in europe or continental europe that didn't have this much of a notion of assistant professor and i thought it was i've never been able to you know make the step in a career and i didn't know anything about crypto i think i do my PhD at taking a seminar on, on DES, right? So that was my <laughs> solid uh, training in, in, in modern cryptography. And then they just gave me time, you know, to learn about cryptography. I got the book by Doug Stinson and, and uh, Bruce Schneier. Um, so that was great. And um, then seven years later, I got uh, one of these cushy chaired position at, at Uni Bochum, um, where I thought, this is really great. Um, what I Mainly because it's, I mean, the most obvious factor is the, the European shared positions, particular in the, you know, Northern European countries, they're very well funded. So I think as, as, as a professor, as an academic, but also as a PhD student, you have more abilities to do stuff. Um, what I do think is, is missing in Europe is, is often this in incentive for high performance, you know, kind of the reward system. Um, but I think particularly in the security domain, Europe, you know, has, has developed a really strong um, track record, and and and, and I uh, do appreciate this better funding situation. That there's less pressure to not only to chase money, but also maybe to work on maybe not on the topics of your own choosing, right? So you have to look where there's money available. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, the, the, the pros and cons, I think, and I enjoy working in both countries. Actually, still, I'm still affiliated with UMass Amherst, so yeah. Long right. answer for a short question, yeah. Another question about like opinions in history. Uh, Tom Morse asks, what has uh, promoted, uh, sorry, what has prompted you to, to launch a conference in cryptographic hardware 20 years ago? How large was the community for that topic at the time? That's, that's, that's my favorite story to tell. So the, the, the community as, as, as a, a well-defined community was zero, right? So they were, whatever happened in the area of, cryptographic hardware, but also cryptographic implementation in general, including software, did not exist as a community period. There were, of course, there were early papers, Chatton wrote, I found very influential papers that I think go back maybe to the 
early 80s or early 1990s, um, but they were scattered over the literature. You know, there were some in IEEE journal, you know, transaction computers had some work. There were a few papers were actually in, in, in crypto in Europe, which kind of defines the crypto community for, you know, the first 10, 15 years, I would guess. Um, and what happened is, and you know, my PhD was on, on, on finite fields. And then I started, when I moved to WPI in 95, I started working on um, crypto implementation, which I totally enjoyed. And I was in touch with chatting and yes, there was email back then. So, um, and, and chatting was also, was one of, of, of the early movers, maybe one of the very first movers. So he had started way earlier than I on, on crypto implementation. And we said, let's do a workshop. And, and I'm not kidding you. We thought if, if you get 60 people, it's going to be a huge success, right? Um, and we were stunned because, you know, if you look at the nice website that, that Peter Schwabe maintains, you see at the first chess in 1999, we had 160 people. And that was like, you know, this just this one chess that was such an eye opener for us, but probably for everybody else. There is this big community that loves crypto implementation and also, you know, industry people that need crypto implementation. Um, so it was, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the time was ripe. Chet and I were really lucky in terms of, of market timing. Nobody expected that. Uh, but it also showed, I think, in, in 99, uh, there was this pretty large chunk of, of, of the crypto community that it was dying to learn more about crypto implementation. So, and then we were lucky. You know, side channel came along. There was pretty much the year side channel were discovered by Paul Kocher at Allen. And the Belcore attack, I think, had been one or two years before. So, like on the side channel front, where both Chet and I, we had not been active, right? Traditionally, the implementation guys. Um, th that was also good market timing. So that was kind of a little bit of a coincidence and luck. Yeah, nice answer. You now mentioned your PhD work and the early works as in crypto implementation. So most you working towards faster implementations. Exactly. Like secure implementations but you've done a lot of works in your in your career so far you've been looking at efficient implementations for constructive work looking at efficient implementations for attacks including building specialized hardware like the Copacabana and the Riviera mm. including lots of bad puns and words um, and now you're working on hardware trojans so what is most rewarding in terms of the areas of working on like design attacks or subversion um, I think, you know, Trojans or subversion, which I think is a fancier word about it, that's what I find very rewarding right now. I think it's a, it's, I totally enjoy working on that because I think they're very exciting research questions. Um, I think the field, at least in the hardware area, is, is somewhat under-researched with respect to um, offensive work. There's been a lot of, of work and a lot of good work on on countermeasures, uh, I still think, as, as a research community at least, we have a very poor understanding about offensive methods that the, the bad guys, you know, our favorite uh, intelligence agencies would actually take. So I think, and this is great, you know, it's really fun doing doing that work um, together with, and this, I haven't had that in, in the last 25 years, you know, since I've worked in, in applied crypto, Evan had that there is this big political relevance to that, right? Like my, 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 my standard introduction, in all the Trojan papers that we write these days, you know, I talk about Huawei and the ban on Huawei by, by in the UK, and this is great. And I, um, I was invited last early summer, so about a little more than a year ago, to Harvard, and I, I, was, I was in the Boston area anyway, and then a postdoc I know said, you know, why don't you give a talk at Harvard. And I didn't know that it was in the um, uh, Kennedy School of Government. So that it was not among the techies, right? And, and that's fun too. So I think, um, and, and I like to change topics, you know, not too often, but probably on average, every five to eight years, I slightly uh, change my topic and uh, my ERCs on that. So I think that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would this also be your advice to young people? So Kevin McCurley asks, what subfields of cryptography do you see as the most promising for young people to work in during this decade? Subfield of finite fields or subfields of cryptography? <laughs> F2, F5? Yeah. No, subfields of cryptography, right? That's the question. Yeah. 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 
Well, it, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm a pretty big fan of also when you start your PhD or as postdoc to focus on the topic, to pick a high, hot topic as opposed to maybe working on something which is a well-established field. And in, 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 in this case, it's easier to find a PhD topic, but it's, it might be harder to distinguish yourself or also to make true progress that a lot of other people have worked on. I think, uh, I think it's, that's an art, I think, you know, picking a good field to, um, uh, to work on. I always felt, and I don't know whether that's the right inclination, I often have an uh, inclination, if there's a hot field, uh, you know, which is microarchitectural text right now, um, you can jump on it. I always, I'm often a little scared of the amount of work that other people are doing. So I'm kind of a fan of finding kind of a, a new, a new interesting problem, and there's no algorithm for that. That's what I mean. It's a little bit of an art to do. So it's it, it's kind of hard for me to say what what you should really work on. I'm in, in general, maybe young people, you should be careful if you find fields where you have a strand of literature that goes back more than one de decade, because then it often indicates that a lot of interesting work has been done. All right. So Christoph, um, Kevin McCurdy asks another question uh, regarding, again, um, software and hardware um, uh, juxtaposition. So cryptographic software is now fast enough to perform almost all cryptographic operations, but still lags in perceived security compared to hardware. Do you think cryptographic hardware will continue to be important in the future now that software is fast enough? Yeah, I think the performance argument is an excellent one of, of Kevin. Um, when you talk to the industry, I feel almost like the opposite trend is happening, that a lot of things is being moved into hardware. Um, I never thought about it like in exactly the terms uh, Kevin framed said. That's a, I think that's a good question. Um, I think one reason is um, uh, the, it's easier to build hardware, so a lot of hardware is more customized than it used to be. I think in the old days, either you had like your classical software system, like Intelish type of thing, or maybe ARM at some point, or you had a dedicated ASICs. But nowadays, uh, I think it's much more common that um, people build the SOC, that system on chip. So you have, a, you have like a big block of silicon and you have a CPU on it, or a bunch of CPUs and a bunch of peripherals. And you see that increasingly that people build that and then they throw in some uh, crypto cores or also just some you know memory protection or small crypto accelerators that's another trend right where you uh, um, sgx and, and arm does the same amd is the same i believe um so i uh, for whatever reason it's maybe because it's it's easier to add dedicated hardware specialized in things like a specialized instructions or random number generator even they are scary, as we heard from Dan. Um, I, to, to some extent, this, this area of, of, of security and hardware is, is rather increasing. You know, and you also, you know, I mentioned microarchitectural attacks before. So, to, to that extent, to some extent, I, I find my field, my expertise of, of uh, uh, hardware security, is increasing over the years. You know. So good news for the next 20 years of chess. So it's nice to hear. Yeah, um, I think we will we, 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 we'll, we'll be busy at chess. Yeah. Another bit of a fanboy question from Tauben Moos. Um, what do you believe has made your introduction to cryptography lecture so successful over the years? And same question for the association book. Oh, OK, it's so my lecture. Well, mainly because I, I think I started teaching early at a small nerdy engineering school. I mean, this is. Um, I taught for essentially all my life in EE programs. So, the, so you have people, people that don't have a background in computer science, not in, in, in abstract mathematics, right? In, in, in finite fields and number theory. So, and, and that's when I developed my first lecture at WPI in 95. That was an um, introductory graduate course in the EE department. Um, and I think early on, I was forced to teach cryptography in a way that's accessible to a lot of people. And that's probably true for my YouTube videos, because this is, I mean, I'm always kidding, but only half kidding, like my, you need like 10th grade of school mathematics, right, uh, to jump in. And I think that's just appealing to people, because this is, there's just always many more people that 
don't have a relevant technical education or the formal training in, in computer science. And uh, if you have a course that's accessible to people with uh, without prior training, this is great. I mean, you see that in my YouTube videos, the, the, the critical comments um, are mostly Christoph is too slow and you know treats us like kindergartners, right? But the upside is it's pretty accessible. So I think it's just I start at a very low level and try to make it uh, understandable. Yeah, and I love teaching. So. There's another question coming back to the Trojans from Dan Bernstein. Um, as a follow-up regarding to Huawei, if the Chinese government or the American government has put backdoors into our router hardware, do you think we'll ever find out and how many years will it take to find out? That's a good question, <laughs> good and hard question. Um, I don't know if it's if it's deep enough. I, I think, it, I mean, what, what I'm working on and some other people, there's actually kind of a nice, a, a slow, a, a small community internationally that looks at hardware reverse engineering. I mean, if they really have a de deeply Im Im embedded Trojan in, an, in a router, you know, routers tend to be big ASICs with, you know, hundreds of millions of, of, of gates or transistors. Um, what's happening right now is that, again, there's a small community, people start doing hardware reverse engineering, so that could be one end, so and actually I had predicted that earlier, but I was totally wrong, when Carsten Noll and, and, and Starbucks and other people um, reversed the MyFair chip, I think it was 2008, so like 12 years ago, and I was super surprised back then how easy it was doing hardware reverse engineering, and I did the famously wrong prediction. Now there will be this strand of research, people start doing hardware reverse engineering, you know, reversing on kind of this, this physical reverse engineering steps, but also learning much more about proprietary chips, maybe Trojans. And I was wrong, but now I see that happening. So there are more and more people publishing on that, how to reverse chips. So that would be one thing that maybe that, uh, and, and we are discussing that in my group, but also with, with other people, you know, should, should, should be open up one of these big chips and start analyzing that. Um, there could be one answer, maybe that is commonplace at some, you know, in five years from now that people can routinely open up chips and, and, and look for Trojans. Um, and then the other answer, but actually Dan can answer the question better than I is, that you are able through some kind of uh, observation on the software level that there is some, uh, uh, some behavior that in indicates a Trojan. But generally speaking, I'm not too optimistic. You know, if, I think if people build in smart Trojans that's specially designed to avoid detection, enjoy. You know, if they're really a, if only a few transistors uh, uh, are altered and, and the behavior is pretty sneaky, that could be very difficult. It's scary. Yeah. So in the same direction, Athanasius Moschus was asking basically also about hardware Trojans and our ability to uh, detect them. Um, he's seeing like a, a difference between academia and industry, and so he's asking, is academia able to conduct testing at such standards compared to industry and properly support the respective results? So if, if uh, industry is claiming that there are no backdoors, for instance, Intel's brand number generator, where your first time the Trojan paper was, was uh, hitting, mm -hmm. um, are we actually able to find this out? Thank you. Okay. This might be an injection attack from Huawei, I don't know, but uh, this was yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm answering your I'm answering your question. Um to be honest, I don't have like the perfect answer for that. I I think the design space of hardware Trojans is so big and, uh, um, and t testing for Trojans, I think that probably uh, uh, relies on a very specific model. That means essentially you, 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 need, you need some information, what kind of Trojans you expect. Um, I think there's always a chance if people really want on the hardware level that you can build a hardware let's say a TRNG to random number generator that passes all tests and is, is, is Trojan free. And it's, for me, it's very hard to imagine this. It's not a way on the hardware level to circumvent that. Mm -hmm. But if you're an industry manufacturer, 
and you don't want to have a Trojan in there. So you Which know- Which is true for the majority we hope, right? Hope yeah. so. Um, so if, if you're designing your RNG or whatever else yourself, and so you know exactly what transistors are supposed to be where, and then you are outsourcing the fabbing to some company. Oh, I see, yeah. No, Follow-up question, and you're getting the the back, uh, the device back, the chip back. Um, I mean, your silicon doting attack would not be possible. It would not be possible to detect with a microscope. Um, but what, in general, are the possibilities for a company to check the chips? Yeah. And figure out yeah. I, I I'm more positive at that scenario, right? I mean, if if you're designer yourself, that that means that that limits the design space of the attacker. Right, I mean, most of the, the, the straightforward Trojans, um, you have to add uh, further logic and you can build something strong, but that can be detected in that scenario that, that you mentioned, Tanya. Um, that's a very active research area. That's, I, I just had a finishing PhD actually by Max Hoffman two months ago, almost as a day. Um, so the, you know these, these uh, um, what we did in an earlier chess paper, we did this uh, doping trojans where we changed the doping of a transistor, and that's relatively hard to detect. But honestly, I think um, if you're really worried about it, it's like about military chip or other high high assurance chips. Um, for instance, with, with with live testing, right? So if you provide live testing points in your circuitry that you can read out information, of course, you would have found our, our Trojans, for instance. So I think if, if you're really worried about it, you can probably you know, work with dedicated scan chains that give you internal information from the chip. So I think that's probably a scenario you can deal with. And I know the DOD the, in, in the US Department of Defense is worried about it, but I think this is kind of a limited tech scenario. And I think we can deal with these type of Trojans. All right. This in your own chips, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this makes the questions come in. So, I mean, before I get to those questions, my question would be like, how would you proceed? So if you're a company, you would check with an electron microscope exactly for what gates are there. You would put probes on the chip to verify that it's behaving the way it, it should be behaving. Um, now, Benedict asked, um, would that sort of scanning for Trojan detection be scalable to hundreds of thousands of chips? Um, yeah, that's what I said before. Of, of course, like this probing, probably not, right? This is too slow. But I think with uh, um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, adding special test circuitry and also um, providing special testing input in a scan chain that gives you, in, gives you internal information, together with a few of the chips are picked at random and checked whether they're more massive uh, um, uh, alterations, I think we can deal with it. This is not cheap and it's not fun, I think, for the companies, right? So there's definitely a huge overhead. But as I, I would think there's a pretty good chance we, we, we should be able to detect Trojans on that level if it, if it affects the system that you designed yourself. Now, Dan Bernstein put his attack hat on again and said, well, given that there are so many possibilities um, and, well, students are creative, shouldn't they just give up on this academia and start working for the highest bidder and build new Trojans? Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether that, that affects students. I think you, you, must, you must have a fair amount of experience both in hardware design and in, 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 in security design and crypto engineering to do that. Um, and what, I think what, 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 what Dan asked, uh, journalists sometimes ask me the question, so what happens? We, we have this big bachelor master programs in, in Bochum. Uh, why don't your people go to the dark side, right? Don't they, they make more money? And I think, uh, uh, luckily, most people are in, in inherently honest and they way rather, you know, work at, a, at, 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 at Google, at Bosch or whatever, you know, as, as a regular job. And it probably, go, probably goes the same with, 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 with Trojans, yeah. Unfortunately, though, um, uh, we have not really observed real hardware Trojans in any meaningful way. And we're definitely far away from that, that we have like whistleblowers, you know, talking about, you know, way back, you know, in the 1990s, how we introduced Trojan in, you know, chip, chip XYZ for intelligence agency and then. Well, this is live stream on YouTube. So maybe we now get some uh, answers uh, in leaks after this. 
Um, that would last be great. Me, actually, this has been a weird year with well us talking virtually and not having face-to-face -face conversations as much. What would you miss, or what do you miss most? I mean, I'm thinking of encounters with you, and there is the karate at the beach in the morning at crypto. There is the coffee breaks at conferences. There's of course student interaction face to face. There's flying to conferences, and well, as you said, giving talks to people, governments, or interested lawyers or whatever. So, 2020, what's the major downside apart from people dying and being sick, like for you personally? You mean uh, yes, as a major downside for me? Yeah. What are you missing most? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, just to say like this this personally meeting of of people. You know, as we see, you know, from from this chess, the flow of information, which is interesting. A lot of that works with this virtual conferences, right? And it's easier for everyone because we we don't have to travel. But these, uh, I think, the one thing that is not happening: meeting new people. I think you know. Tanya, you and I, we, we still see each other a couple of times per year or more often, right? And we know each other. So I think maintaining existing relationships works nicely. But these random encounters, right, at the beach barbecue, right? You know, talking to a you know lawyer from some startup at Silicon Valley, which would never happen. Uh, I miss that. And you know, you, you can't touch people. So that's kind of yeah. The, yeah. Okay. I guess it's a nice okay. closing this uh, virtual conference because there is now exactly the socializing coming up so we shouldn't cut into that so thank you very much christoph for answering all the questions and thanks to the audience and those who contributed questions uh, on zulip um, always the encouragement if you're a registered participant and you are on zulip please go there ask more questions and maybe christoph will also take some time to answer there as well so great thanks everybody bye